Some of the material covered in this presentation has already been done in class, but most of it's going to be the focus of the examples and problems that we're going to be looking at in the third day of class. I want to warn you that sometimes you'll see me or hear me talking about one thing, see a different thing on the screen. You may want to listen to what I have to say during a particular screen, then pause it and read what's on the screen before continuing to the next page. Physics uses mathematics as a foreign language. We very carefully define particular symbols, variables, to refer to a particular quantity like position or displacement. Position, for example, is either x or y. So we don't look at y as a function of x. We look at x, the position on a horizontal axis, as a function of time. So x will be graphed on the vertical, on the vertical axis in a graph with time on the horizontal axis on a graph. So we use x to measure dimensions horizontally from an origin, plus or minus y to measure positions vertically, x. And we would also have a displacement, which is delta x or delta y, the difference between two positions. Average velocity is a very specific thing. It is defined to be that delta x displacement divided by the time over which you made that displacement. So x2 is the position at time t2, x1 is the position at time t1. This is equation 2.1. We use it for many other things in class, but it was also a fairly basic sort of definition that we use in the lab to estimate as instantaneous velocity. When you let that delta t in the denominator go to zero, you go from having a secant line to a tangent line. You see this at the beginning of calculus. The instantaneous velocity, which we call v, is the slope of that tangent line. It's the slope of the line that is tangent to x at a particular time t. And that means it's the derivative. The definition is the limit as delta t goes to 0 of delta x over delta t. In calculus, you call that x prime of t, the derivative. In physics, we prefer the notation dx dt. The reason we like this notation is called the Leibniz notation that you'll also find in your calculus book, is that it looks like the dx dt. As delta t goes to 0, it turns into this infinitesimally small differential, as it's called, the dt. And we can then see in our notation exactly what variables are being used and think of them as being sort of like a delta x over delta t slope. You can't measure instantaneous velocity period, end of story. If you want to log, argue about it, I'd love to. But anyway, all measurements have to be averaged over some time interval. It can make it really, really, really tiny, but it can't be made zero. That's calculus, not physics. And because we're always measuring over a finite time interval, we are always approximating the velocity when we measure it in the lab. For some time interval from t1 to t2, we calculate the average velocity from the delta x over the delta t, and we assume that that is equal to the instantaneous velocity at the midpoint of that interval. This is an excellent approximation that can be justified with calculus. In fact, it is exactly the instantaneous velocity if the acceleration is constant. So for many of the things we do in the lab, this is, goes beyond an approximation to being nearly an exact representation of what we're trying to measure. Speed is not velocity. Your calculus book uses speed as if it is velocity, but it is not velocity. Speed is the magnitude of the velocity, a very technical quantity. It's the magnitude of the vector if the velocity is a vector. Average speed is the total distance divided by the time over which the movement took place. So you would calculate it similarly to the way you calculate average velocity, but the numerator is the total distance you traveled, not the displacement. And because that is the case, average speed is not the magnitude of the average velocity. It is the total distance traveled over the time it took to travel. If you go in a circle, when you come back to the origin, your average speed will be not zero, but your average velocity will be zero. That's the kind of thing that we'll actually do some examples and demonstrate in class. That equation, 2.1, is always true. It can be written a lot of different ways. 
For example, you take this expression that is our definition of delta x over delta t and multiply it out and rewrite it a little bit and you've got x2 equals x1, that is final position equals initial position plus v average times delta t. If we let our initial time be zero and our final time be just plain old t, the dummy variable t, then we can see that that also defines an x function, that is a function of time where x0 is the initial position, v average is a number that depends on t, v average depends on t, times t. But it does make, ex not a very useful expression, but it does make clear that x is a function of time. Acceleration is the change in velocity, just like before. v2 is the velocity at time t2, v1 is the velocity at time t1 when the acceleration is constant, which is what we're going to do in this course, then the average acceleration is just a number called a, and the velocity, when you solve that expression for v2, is just a straight line, where v1 is the uh, velocity at time t1, and if you add a times delta t to that, you get v2. If we choose t1 to be 0, then v1 is the intercept, and a is the slope. This is one version of our first equation, which v of t equals v0 plus at in this form. v0 is the intercept, a is the slope, and v as a function of time is just v0 plus at. v of t, that is a function. It gives us the instantaneous velocity at time t. v of 0 is the velocity at time t equals 0, otherwise called the initial velocity and the acceleration a is just the constant value of the acceleration function. That's the first equation, 2.7, of the group of 5 that you'll need to know for chapters 2 and 3. The others are 210, 211, 29, and 316.